midst of that, I want you to turn to somebody and just say, good morning. Welcome to Hope Church. If you're online right now, just tell somebody, good morning. So glad you're here. All right, you guys can be seated. Today, I'm rocking a, a new shirt here at Hope Church today. Uh, we kind of like our T-shirts, but these are our red shirts. And if you see anybody in these red shirts, this is our prayer team. They're wearing these shirts today, and it just simply says, how can I pray with you today? It doesn't say, how can I pray for you? Because we are not a Catholic church. This is not a confessional, and they are not priests, right? And so what they want to do is come alongside you and pray with you. And so if you see anybody in a red shirt during the morning, during our time together, even after our services, even at the very end of our service today, that really is their heartbeat and their mission is just to come alongside of you, lift a burden that you have, and just help point you to Jesus. On the back of the t-shirt, it says, we'll be praising him for today, right? And so part of our prayer life is not just bringing requests to him, but it's also praising God for the amazing things that he's doing in our life. And so you can grab somebody in a red shirt every once in a while and just say, hey, I want to thank God for this thing that's happened in my life right now. I want to thank God that you prayed a few weeks ago with me about this thing and God answered the prayer. Do you know how often you and I keep praying and we miss out on all the answered requests that God's given us because we don't make time to just stop and praise God for all the good things that he's doing? And so we want to pray, but we also want to praise God as part of our prayer life. And so just want to make you aware of that so you know who our red shirt prayer team members are. They are passionate about prayer, which we love here at Hope Church. Um, if you're new to Hope Church or maybe you're just jumping in with us, we are in a brand new teaching series that we just kicked off last week called Follow the Way of Jesus. And if you missed last week's message, I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to it online. If you're online right now, you may want to stop and just jump back into last week's message on YouTube because we began with a baseline of saying we first need to understand the simple invitation Jesus makes when he calls for you and I to just simply follow him. We said we got to make sure first and foremost that we're following Jesus. We didn't know what that looks like. What was the simple invitation? It was a simple invitation, but it was also so very profound when Jesus says, follow me. He says, to follow me, it's going to cost you something. It costs Jesus his life, and he gives it to us freely, but it also costs us our life in return. So I just want to start there to make sure that you have that foundation, because we are going on this kind of 10-month journey together, and we're journeying closer to the heart of Jesus together. So over the next 10 months from now all the way through July, we're going to be looking at the teachings of Jesus, the parables of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the seven I am statements that Jesus makes in scripture. We're gonna be immersing ourselves in all things Jesus, okay? And the whole goal is that you and I would get to know Jesus more and really begin to ask ourselves, am I becoming more and more like him? That is the goal, right? Here at Hope Church, our mission is very simple. We wanna help everyone, everyone we come in contact with to follow, grow, and live for Tad Grand Staff. For a denomination, for a church, for a political party. No, for who? For Jesus, right? At the end of the day, we want people who are following and growing and living their lives on mission for Jesus. That's the heartbeat of this church. That's why we got out of bed this morning. Because I believe somebody here today, somebody online, someone in the world is going to follow Jesus for the very first time. Somebody's going to take a step closer to the heart of Jesus today. We have next steps happening today right after the service. Next steps is our process to help people follow, grow, and live for Jesus. We're going to have a room full of people today who are going to take one step closer to the heart of Jesus. And the whole goal is not just for us to have church, entertain ourselves, but when we leave the doors of this place today or we tune off online today, that we would go live our lives on mission for Jesus. That's a great segue into our conversation today. We're going to begin the next few weeks looking at a very famous sermon. In fact, I would say it's the most famous sermon in the world. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's the recorded sermon of Jesus. If you've never read the Sermon on the Mount before, I would encourage you to pick up a Bible and read through it because Jesus covers about every issue under the sun from Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. He, he literally is no stone unturned. He begins to just kind of dig through every single issue, and it really begins to call followers of Jesus up to a different standard, to a new way of living. He says, if you really want to know you're my follower, a fully devoted follower of mine, this is what it looks like. This is the life that I've called for you to live. 
So I want to do today, kind of as we jump into uh, this, this message from Jesus, I want to just kind of give you just a little bit of context to the region and the area. If you're not familiar, we have a picture here today just to kind of show you of where this sermon was taking place. And so the body of water here is the Sea of Galilee. And somewhere up on the mount, Jesus at the top of the mount, that mount now is referred to as the Mount of Beatitudes. And the reason why it's called the Mount of Beatitudes is because Jesus begins Matthew chapter 5, which is known as the Beatitudes. We're not going to talk about Beatitudes today. We're going to jump down a little further today. But it's believed that Jesus was up on this hillside. I have not been to this region. My, my parents have been there. My brother has been there. And they say that this region has incredible acoustics, just with the body of water behind it, where it sits on a hill. And so if you kind of envision for a moment Jesus on top of the hill, he's got his 12 disciples there, and he has a large gathering of people who are interested in following Jesus, have just begun to follow Jesus. And again, Jesus is gonna elevate his conversation and saying, if you really wanna know the life that I've called for you to live, this is what it looks like. If you have a Bible today, go ahead and get to Matthew chapter 15. If you don't, I mean, Matthew chapter five, if you don't, that's okay. We're gonna be in verses 13 through 16 today, kind of walking very slowly over the next few weeks. Look what Jesus says. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, so Jesus always speaks kind of in parables and stories, illustrations. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus starts with this kind of illustration of salt and light. If you want to take some notes with us today, you can write this down. Why does Jesus reference salt and light? Why does he start there? Why does Jesus make this reference to salt and light, what's so important? What we know about Jesus is that, again, Jesus is going to say, I want to lay out before you, what does it look like to really be my disciple? Again, here at Hope Church, we define a disciple of Jesus as somebody who's following Jesus, growing with Jesus, and living for Jesus. He says, if you want to know what it means to be a fully devoted follower of mine, this is what it looks like. This is the life that I've called for you to live. Again, this is Jesus' first sermon that's on record, and Jesus doesn't mince words. Again, when you start to dig into Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus is just going to lay the hammer down on a bunch of issues. But what I love about Jesus is that when Jesus teaches, he has the perfect balance of truth and grace. I would tell you be very wary of a sermon that's just 100% grace without truth. Also be very wary of a sermon that's 100% truth with no grace, right? We need a balance of both. You need grace and truth. And Jesus is the perfect balance of 100% grace, but 100% truth. He loves us enough to show us God's grace and kindness, but he loves us enough to tell us the truth about our lives. Do you see that? This is what's so important for every single one of us to understand. That's why it's the greatest sermon ever recorded and given, given by the greatest teacher that God has ever gifted to us. So again, one of the things Jesus is liking us to in our culture today and to the people that were listening who would have understood these kind of two illustrations that Jesus is using was the importance of, of salt and light. How many of you know that, that salt, a small little grain of salt is very almost hard to see but with, the, with the human eye, right? I mean, it's there, you can see it, but it's kind of difficult to see. And a little bit of salt doesn't really make much of a difference, right? You can put a little pinch of salt in something, and you probably really can't taste it, right? But then you put too much salt into something, and it'll ruin whatever it is that you're cooking, right? So you think about that balance for just a moment. We're going to unpack this in just a second. But he also uses this illustration of light. Again, in this day, salt, very common thing, staple in, in a home, light, very important during this day. But how many of us know that, that light's a good thing, but too much light can blind you? Not enough light can make you feel unsafe in a very dark environment, can it? So Jesus is going to use these two illustrations to really begin to dig into our lives to, to talk about us being salt and light and what that looks like. So let's start for just a few moments and let's unpack this issue of salt and light, what we'll get to in the second half. But I want to give you kind of 
kind of some foundational ideas that we're going to build off of today. So if you're taking some notes, you can write this down. Salt represents our influence in the world. This is what Jesus wants you to know. Salt represents your influence in the world, and light represents your testimony to the world. This is what he's going to unpack together. Salt represents your influence. Are you having an influence? Because he believes as a Jesus follower, you will have an influence in the world. He also says that light represents your testimony. You willing to tell people who Jesus is and what he's done, your testimony to the world. So what does salt do? Let's start with salt. Let's, let's start there. Let's unpack a little bit of salt. Did you know that there is literally a Salt Institute website? You can, you can Google search this. And the Salt Institute website has discovered 14,000 uses for salt. You can go read all of those today if you want to. If you've got some time today and you're bored this afternoon, you can scroll through the Salt website. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna focus on three of them today. What do we know that salt does? The first thing we know that salt does is salt enhances taste. How many of you like salt? How many, how many like salt? How many know salt's bad for you, but you still like it, okay? And too much salt, not, not a good thing. If you were to go to the movie theater with my father-in-law, my father-in-law is known to bring his own salt shaker with him. <laughs> Anybody else do this? He's the only person, probably, so he's the only person I've ever seen do this before. And he will salt his popcorn, and he brings a little thing of spray butter, and he will squirt his, his popcorn in his hand. We'll go to a restaurant, and he's been known to whip out his own bacon bits for his salad. He's, he's, a, he's an awesome individual, right? And so we know, we know salt's not healthy, but we like the taste of salt, right? You make some, some soup, and you don't put salt in it, pretty bland, right? You ever had french fries without salt on them? What a waste of time, right? What, I mean, it's just like... What a waste of time. Who didn't do their job? Somebody missed the mark over at McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or something. You know, like, this is, this is crazy, right? What happens when you put salt on food is that it unleashes the flavors, right? And then you apply it to food. Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth. You are basically here to exist to unleash God's flavor on the world. Think about this for a moment. How often have the followers of Jesus given a bad taste to the world? Isn't it too much salt? People who are just jerks with faith end up destroying the very fabric of who Jesus is, right? And then you have some people who aren't salty enough and they also dilute and destroy the very truth of who God is, right? So he said that you and I have been unleashed to be the salt of the earth, to be God's God's flavor for the world. What's this look like for you and I? When I'm talking about being salt in the world, I'm talking about what does true love look like? To be the love of God means walking through a tough time with somebody who's walking through a very difficult time in a marriage or with a child who's maybe making some really poor decisions. Or maybe somebody you know in your life who is walking through a really horrible situation that they caused by their sinful actions, and instead of you running away from them or judging them, you show them what true love looks like, and you walk through that season of life with them. What does salt look like? It looks like real forgiveness. It's being quick to offer forgiveness to those who have wronged or attacked you. How how quick are we to hold on to bitterness and anger and resentment. Hey, if you're an angry person, come next week because Jesus, very next thing he gets into is the issue of anger, right? So how quick are we to forgive and to show love the way that we've been called to? What does salt look like? It looks like authentic grace, extending grace to people who don't deserve it. You know what you and I have in common? We didn't deserve the grace of God. We still don't deserve the grace of God. And the longer we journey with Jesus and the more we attend church, the more we start to believe that we deserve the grace of God. We don't deserve any of it. And so we have got to be people who understand we're undeserving so we freely give away God's grace to the other people who are undeserving of it. This is what God's called for you and I to do. This type of living makes Christianity tasty. 
I would have said years ago, it makes Christianity zesty, but I have kids and you can't use that word in this culture any longer. It means a lot different thing today in our world today. And so it adds flavor. What else does it do? What else does salt do? It, salt, same thing is it preserves. How many of you know that people during this day didn't have refrigeration? They didn't have a way to keep meat cold. And so to keep meat from rotting and to keep food from rotting, they would pack it full of salt. And what would salt do? It would keep the meat from spoiling. It kept it from decaying. I can remember when I was a kid, maybe we were at the beach on vacation and maybe I would fall and, and skin my knee or something like that. And my mom would say, hey, go swim in the ocean. You ever have somebody tell you to do this? You have a cut or a sore? Why? Because that salt and that water would work as a, a, something that would preserve, but it would also be a healing agent, wouldn't it? It would begin to heal something because salt and water helps disinfect and heal a wound. I want you to think about the people that you have contact with right now in your life. I want you to think about your sphere of influence because everybody here today, everybody watching online, we all have a different sphere of influence. You have different relationships and friends and family and work environments and college campuses and high school campuses and middle school campuses. And we all have different circles. And I want you to think about the people who are in your life, the people in your neighborhood, your community. I want you to think about those people. Who are the people you know or who are helping bring healing and hope to other people? Do you have somebody in your mind when you think about your sphere of influence? Who are the people around me who are bringing healing and hope to someone's life? Who is the voice in the family or friend circle who are helping others walk in faith and obedience with God? Who are the people who are speaking and pointing people to God's truth and God's love? Who are the people in your life who are not only making you a better person, but are pulling you along and pulling you closer to the heart of Jesus? These are the salt of the earth type of people. The people who are willing to go into an environment and to be the salt and the flavor of God in the world that the world so desperately needs. God wants us to influence our friends and the world around us to make the right choices to live a godly life. Being sought around us is helping other people's lives not rot and decay by sin. You say, well, hold on, is that my responsibility? I think the whole great commission that Jesus gave us is that we would go into the world and we would tell others the good news message of Jesus Christ. And so it is our responsibility. I mean, Romans asks us the questions. It says, how will anyone know if we don't go do our job and tell them? So if somebody's looking for truth, if somebody doesn't know their life was upside down, if somebody is unaware of their sinful decisions, how will they know? Now, again, how you approach them determines how they receive what you're about to tell them, right? So if you come at them condescending and judgmental and on a high horse and condemning, that doesn't sound a whole lot like Jesus, does it? But if you come from love and grace, you know what I know? Jesus was willing to give people love and grace, and those who needed it never left offended. The only people left offended were the super religious who thought they were more superior than Jesus, right? Those who were desperate for love and grace always received the love and grace of Jesus. What else does salt do? What else does salt do? Salt, the third thing today is that it creates thirst. You ever discovered after you eat something salty how thirsty you become? I mean, something salt, salty, it creates a thirst. Jesus says, you are salt in the world. In other words, God wants us to partner with him in this mission he's given us. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to live in such a way that people are thirsty for the things of God in a relationship with Jesus just simply by how we live our lives and love other people. You should live your lives in such a way that those around you are thirsty for what you have. Does that make sense? They should see something in you. This is a great challenge for all of us. Whether you're an adult today, whether you're a young adult, whether you're a student, whether you're a child, Jesus calls us to live our lives in such a way that our influence permeates culture, that it permeates our workplace, that it permeates our schools and our campuses. In other words, enough of conforming to culture. Listen to me, church. Enough of us is trying to blend in. Enough of letting the culture influence us and dictate to us how we should live. 
dictate what's acceptable and normal in society. We live as God's people to be counter to culture because the more we look like the world, the less we look like Jesus. The more we act like the world, the less we act and look like Jesus. Jesus challenges his audience to influence, to change the culture, not by picketing or boycotting or fighting or rioting, but he says by living our lives in such a way that people look at us and say, what is it about you? There is something in you that's different. What, what is it about your life? Because you walk through stuff the same way that I do, and I see there's something. There, there, is, there is a peace in your life. There's a jewel in your life. It, it appears that your life is anchored to something far greater than this world. What is your life about? What is it that you have? We should live our lives in such a way that people who don't know Jesus, their interest is piqued by what we have. You know, we should live our lives in such a way that people who don't know Jesus shouldn't be surprised that we are following Jesus. When we finally get around to tell them, they should be like, what? You're one of those people? I had no idea. That should scare us a little bit, shouldn't it? I didn't even know that you had faith. I didn't even know that your life was different. You just kind of blended in with everybody else. You kind of do what everybody else did. You talk like everybody else does. You manage your marriage the same way the rest of the world does. You manage your finances the way the world does. You manage your kids the way the world does. We should look like the world. We're called to be different, not perfect. We're called to strive for holiness and righteousness and to live our lives in such a way that the world looks at us and says, man, I want what you have. And here's the beauty of the church. A little bit of salt by itself makes a little difference. But see, the vision for God's church is a lot of salt. We're a lot of salt today, right? Turn to somebody right now and say, we're a lot of salt today. You're, we're a lot of salt today. You're very salty. You're very salty today. You're very salty. A lot of salt together, what happens is that we can permeate a culture. We can help change a community. We can help permeate God's word and truth into our, 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 our community here, our nation, and our world. And that's what we're trying to do with the church. So what's the challenge today? The challenge today for us to be effective and make a difference is, is that we have to understand this today. We must be salt distributors. How does salt get out, right? We got to distribute a little bit, so I'm not going to back in the stage today. We'll leave that to Pastor Brian. Uh, but uh, we're going to distribute a little bit of salt, right? I mean, in here, it does no good, right? I got all this salt inside of me. It's good. We think about how we're going to contain it and hold on to all the salt. My life is full of salt. I have all the salt. Well, what good is the salt if it's just contained? The whole point of it is that it would make a difference, that it would bring life to something. And so you and I have got to commit our lives today to say, you know what? I want to be a distributor of salt. I want to get out of this church, and I want to engage society in our community. Right? We can't walk in fear of culture. We must understand that we've been placed in the world with all the power of, of heaven given inside of us to be change agents through the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what God's called for us to do. Back in Jesus' day, when they would gather together salt, salt was gathered in a way that sometimes impurities and imperfections would get into the salt. Sometimes dirt would get in. And when impurities got mixed into the salt, what would happen is that salt would then become useless. So Jesus says, salt that doesn't have use should be thrown away. Look what he says in verse 13. He said, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So Jesus starts to draw this idea between like real salt and polluted salt what pure salt looks like and what polluted salt looks like. You know, I know there are people in our lives today, if you can kind of envision for a moment, who are sitting at the table of life. When you sit at the table for somebody over Thanksgiving or a meal, someone says, can you pass the what? Can you pass the, the salt, right? And what they're doing is they're reaching for salt. They're reaching for truth. Just kind of envision with me for a moment, an illustration form. People are searching and desperate. And when they grab a hold of what we say we have, they want to know, is this the real thing? You know, we got people in our lives today who are desperate and hungry for real truth, for real hope, for real love, 
for real redemption, for real grace, for real mercy. And they want to know, is this thing that I'm holding on to, that I'm willing to give my life to, is it in fact the real thing? When you and I allow our lives to be polluted by the world, I'm not saying we're going to be sinless. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect. But when we say that we're sought and we willfully allow our lives to be polluted by sin, then you and I are distorting and perverting exactly what God has called for us to be about. I mean, doesn't Revelation tell us that God wants us hot or cold? But he says, lukewarm, spew us out of his mouth. We can't be people who are sort of in the world and sort of in the sin and sort of in culture and sort of in the things of Jesus and expect to be the salt that he's called for you and I to be. He says, I need you to be people who are striving and straining for righteousness. You can't do it by yourself, but I've given you a way. Oh, and I've given you a gift of Holy Spirit so you can strive and strain closer to the heart of Jesus. If you're a journey with me, my promise in return to you is that I will begin to draw out of you those imperfections if you allow me to. It's part of what salt does, right? Jesus is salt in our life, and he's trying to draw out the things that make us sick. He's trying to heal us and make us whole. He's trying to bring us in closer to what God ultimately wants for our life. Are we willing today to be change agents, to be the salt of the earth? We live in such a way that we will cause other people to thirst for what we have. Will we help others in our world, in our home, in our marriages, in our lives be able to be preserved? through all the pollution of this world, will we be the people that God has called for us to be? One hand, we're called to be salt. Jesus also references us to be light. In Matthew chapter five, Jesus mentions two sources of light. He references a light as a city on a hill, and he represents a lamp and, and light. And so he's gonna unpack both of those for us today. And so what happens is as Jesus is standing on this hillside, overlooking a body of water, he begins to make this reference to light and people would have easily been able to understand and be able to draw the conclusion of what Jesus was talking about. How many of you have ever been out on a lake or the ocean and you've gone way out into the water and maybe you've been out until nightfall and you can see way off on the shoreline, you can see the smallest of light in the middle of darkness, can't you? Right? Maybe you, you went out during the daytime and you really couldn't see many homes or houses, but all it takes is one little light on a hill to expose there's a home there, doesn't it? The smallest of light exposes the greatest of darkness, doesn't it? Little teeny light can show up anywhere, right? You can see it in the middle of darkness. And so Jesus is kind of drawing this conclusion to you and I being this type of light. The second illustration he gives is a lamp. Now, during Jesus' day, most homes would have just had two rooms. Right, you kind of had a bedroom area that, that you, you and probably both of your family all slept in the same bedroom. Much of like if you go to the DR today or Haiti, you kind of see the same kind of setup. They kind of have a little bedroom off to the side, and you kind of have a main area where your kitchen and eating and everything happens in that one room. And during Jesus' day, they wouldn't have had couches and furniture. They would probably have had a small table that was in kind of a living room, dining room area. And as night would draw in, they would bring in this kind of low, small table into the room. And if you had guests over or friends of family, you would kind of recline around the table. And what you would do is you would take a lamp and you would set it on the middle of the table. And this would be the light source for your entire house. And so Jesus says, if you were to put a light on the table in your home, he says that you wouldn't put a pot over that light. You wouldn't put a basket over it, would you? So that would be pointless. The whole purpose of the lamp is to give light to everyone who's in the house, right? So Jesus is speaking this message Everyone in the crowd would have been like, this is stupid, right? Yeah, I mean, we understand this concept of light, right? And so Jesus would then look at the, the crowd. Jesus would speak audibly to us today. And he's saying this point, I need you to know that you are that light. He's not saying you might be a light or you should pray about being a light. You should consider whether you are a light or not. He says, if you're my follower and you belong to me, you are are the light of the world. He doesn't even command them to go be a light. He says you already are the light. You just have to ask yourself, are you letting your light shine? Are you covering and hiding your light in the darkness? And can I be honest, in a world today 
where society and culture are so loud and booming, most Jesus followers are terrified to let their light shine, aren't they? I don't want to be canceled. I don't want to be ridiculed. I don't want to go against the grain. I don't want to speak up for what's right. I don't want any opposition. I don't want any pushback. And so I'll just hide in the shadows. And I think a great deal of what we see happening in our world today, especially in our own country, is I think there have been so many Jesus followers who have been terrified to speak up and be the light. And I think the reason why is if you grew up like I did, a, a, a church kid in the 80s, as I think the church of the 70s and 80s just spoke a message that was just really contrary to the heart of God. It was very just condescending. It was very hellfire and brimstone. We just came down on people. We beat people up. We didn't show people the grace and love of God. And so what happened is, is so many Christians who grew up in that environment said, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the guy who's out in the corner again boycotting and rioting and picketing. And so what happens, we just went mute. And people stopped speaking truth. And we stopped doing the things that God has called for us to do. And we confuse ourselves by saying, if I become a person who speaks up, then our mind thinks I got to become that person. But the problem is I don't see that person in the life of Jesus at all. And so what does light do? Let's just take some notes. What does light do? Light, first and foremost, we know exposes the darkness. What happens when you turn the light on in a dark room, right? The light quickly expels the darkness and it disappears. Anybody here today afraid of the dark? Come on, anybody? Come on. I know there's more of y'all in here than that that are afraid of the dark, right? You ever have that moment where you're kind of afraid of the dark and you're kind of sprinting across the house to get the light switch on, right? Or maybe you're outside and you're trying to get to a light switch outside. And doesn't it feel like when you're in darkness that there just seems to be some kind of ominous presence with you? Doesn't it always feel that way? It just gets dark and all of a sudden it just starts to feel eerie, doesn't it? It just feels like there's somebody else in the room. You start convincing yourself, somebody else, there's a presence with us, right? In the Bible, though, listen to me, light is a symbol of the presence of God. So if darkness has a presence in the field, light is the opposite. It says that light is a symbol of the presence of God. Look what it says in John 8, 12. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life. Jesus tells us that he is the light of the world. And when he lives inside of us, he becomes a light that shines within our lives. John says, well, without this light, people are walking in darkness. People all around us are walking in darkness because they are void of the light of Jesus. They have never been exposed to the life-changing presence of Jesus Christ. So what does light do? Light exposes darkness. The second thing it does is that light serves as a guide. Serves as a guide. Anybody here ever gone into like some caverns? You ever been down to the caverns? Um, my, my dad's side of the family, the Grant's dad's side of the family, hails from an area called Luray, Virginia. Um, and Luray, Virginia is really known for one thing, the Luray Caverns. And so growing up as a kid, we would go visit there pretty frequently. And so if you've ever gone down deep into the caverns, you just keep going down and you keep going down and you keep going down and you are so far deep under the ground. And at some point, the guide is going to cut off all the lights if you've ever been in the caverns before. And all of a sudden, if you've never experienced what true utter darkness is, go hundreds of feet under the ground and everyone cut off the lights and all of a sudden you are exposed to utter darkness. You literally can't see your hand in front of your face. There is no hope of any light source around you. And it just feels eerie, scary, ominous, hopeless, purposeless, terrifying, doesn't it? And yet Jesus says, this is exactly what people are living life like who are lost in spiritual darkness. He says, people around us who are lost in spiritual darkness, they literally can't see their hand in front of their face. Their life is living right now in a way that there's no hope for their life. So they turn to the wrong things to navigate through the darkness of life. Jesus called us lights because we're responsible for pointing people out of darkness, out of a life that has no hope and no future, out of a life that will lead them to eternal darkness through the love and the light and the hope of Jesus Christ. How many of us could be honest? We have friends and family members right now who are spiritually lost, who are living lives involved in crazy sin, and it doesn't even bother them at all because they don't have Jesus. They don't have Holy Spirit in their life. We say this all the time here at Hope Church. Why are we caught off guard when people who are far from God 
act like people far from God. Why are we shocked by that? I always say we should not be shocked when people who are far from God act like people far from God. We should be shocked when people who claim to be close to God act like people far from God. Right? But we'll spend all of our time, oh, I can't believe the world. Oh, I can't believe they did it. Oh. And it's like, what do, what do we expect people to do? They're lost. They're desperate. They're looking for something in life to fulfill them, to give them purpose, hope, value, meaning. They're looking for everything they can, desperate and hungry and thirsty for the real thing. So as a result of them being lost in this world, they don't feel the conviction because the light has never been exposed to the darkness in their life. The Bible says they are actually dead in sin. You know that prior to meeting Jesus, every single one of us were dead in sin. But an amazing thing happens. When someone who's lost in darkness gets exposed to the light of Jesus and the Holy Spirit begins to penetrate the darkness, it's, it's just like someone flips a light switch on inside their life. The presence of life begins to make that darkness disappear. Listen, Jesus says you have the light of life. In other words, the Holy Spirit can use how you live your life, how you share your testimony to shine a light into someone else's life and to lead them away from darkness into God's marvelous light, as the scripture says, right? How will that happen? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, verse 16. He says, in the same way, let your life shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. He says that we can just simply live our lives in a God honoring way. Live our lives with our hands and our heart and our mouths being used for God. And we can live in such a way that the works we're doing for God on behalf of God, that our works will point people to God our Father. How amazing is that? Just by how we simply let our light shine, we should live our lives in such a way that people, as I've already said, look at us and say, you're different than everyone else. You're not perfect, and that's what I like about you. You're real, and you're authentic, and you drip grace, but there is something about your life that is so different. I want what you have. And those are the moments where it points people to the glory of God, and it gives you an opportunity to say, let me tell you what I have. No, I'm not perfect, and I don't have it all together. Let me tell you what God rescued and saved me from. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. Let me tell you who he is. Let me tell you the anchor he's been in the middle of my storms. Let me tell you about the chains that he has broken in my life. Let me tell you the sins he has set me free from. Let me tell you the addictions that I've walked away from through his power and strength. Let me tell you who my God is. This is our opportunity as a church. This is what God has called the church to be. This is how he's called for us to live our lives. So what's the challenge today? The challenge is that we must be the light of Jesus. We must be the hope of Jesus. We are to be reflectors of the light of Jesus. I mean, there's so many illustrations you could use, like the sun and moon, right? We know the moon is just a reflection of the radiance of the sun, right? And I would tell you that you and I are supposed to be the same way. We are just supposed to reflect the light and the hope of God himself to the world. We were created in the image of God, for the glory of God, to worship God, to serve God, and our lives should reflect the nature and love of who God is. We gotta be very careful, though, of the light that we reflect and what type of light we reflect because the Bible tells us that we have a real enemy who lives in this world who disguises himself as a source of light. We have to be very cautious of what we're reflecting because the Apostle Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, he says, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. What kind of light would attract people in that is contrary to the light of God? Well, it's a light that kind of looks like the real thing, sort of sounds like the real thing. It's extremely appealing but it's really a cheap imitation of what God offers. It's a false light that tells you that God loves you. You're like, well, I thought that's truth. But they'll say, God loves you, so it's okay to live however you want. God loves you, so it's okay to make whatever decision you want because God loves you and he is love and God's only job is to forgive you of your sins so you can live in sin and live however you want to live. And that sounds really appealing, right? 
Like I can have the love in God. I can have a place called heaven. I can spend an eternity with him and live however I want. What a great deal. And that's really contrary to what God calls for us to live. What's a false light look like? In our world today, it's very culturally relevant to say, you know what? All paths lead to God. Any path you're on, as long as you're living a moral life and a good life, all religions and all little G gods ultimately lead to one big G God. So you just get on a path of spirituality. You get on a path of enlightenment. You try to live the best life that you can. And God, who loves you in the end, will show you grace and mercy and just welcome you in. And it's like, well, that's not really truth. That's not really the light of Jesus. We got to be very careful that we don't have this kind of feel good fall to light that's contrary to what God has. And as a result, that light is actually leading people straight to eternal darkness in a place called hell. Yeah, that sounds very intense. It really is that intense. The mission is really that big. There's that much weight. It is literally in the balance and eternity of a place called heaven and a place called hell. And it was so serious and it's such a big deal that God invaded earth and gave us Jesus to die on a cross for us, to shed his blood for us, to sacrifice his life for us, was placed into a tomb for us, defeating sin and death, and was risen victorious through God on the third day through the power of the Holy Spirit to rescue and save us from a place called hell. He didn't come to play games. He came to give the ultimate price for our life. And so we have got to understand this. And he's saying, if you're going to receive what I've offered you, I'm calling you to live your life in response to who I am and what I've offered and what I've done. We have to make sure that we are reflecting the truth and that we're reflecting the real thing, the real light. So the final thing today, again, is we must let our light shine. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 15, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. A hidden light is a useless light. I would encourage you today, don't hide your light. Turn to somebody right now and say, don't hide your light. Don't hide your light. You know, we hide our light. We hide our light because we lack the boldness so often to believe that we can actually live into the light that we project. Can we just be honest? I don't want to shine my light because I can't live into it. I'm terrified if I shine my light, people are going to call me a hypocrite. I'm terrified if I begin to shine light, can I really stand here? Do I have a foundation to stand on? And here's the good news. It's left to yourself. The bad news is you're probably not going to make it. But the good news is that God hasn't left us to ourselves. He says, you know what? I know that you're fallible. I know that you're sinful. I know that you won't have it all together. That's why I've given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do it by yourself. He says, hey, you guys realize this. Every amazing thing Jesus accomplished on this earth, even defeating sin and death, when Jesus leaves this world, he says, hey, guys, I got to go because something better than me is coming in my place. He says, all the things you see me be able to do were only made possible through my father, through his presence and his power and his spirit. And I'm going to leave. I came to do all this so that in my place, God can place that power inside of you. And so Jesus says this words. He says, hey, church, you will see even greater things than what I've done. That's amazing, right? And how Often we undercut ourselves because we look at ourselves just like I do and I think I'm incapable, I don't have it, and I can't on my own but Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, but what God offers us. We can be exactly who God has called for us to be and fulfill the mission he's placed in front of us. We have been called today to be change agents, to be people who pull people out of darkness and point people to the light and hope of Jesus. We are called to be ambassadors of hope, agents of reconciliation and redemption. We are called to be salt and light. I love the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans is speaking to a group of Christians who are literally in an awful, perverse, godless society and culture. When you think we have it bad today in our world today, just go read the book of Romans. These people were perverse and awful and godless and they hated Christianity and everything that it stood for. And Paul prays a prayer for them 
And this prayer is what we founded this church on. That's Romans chapter 15, verse 13. He says that I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. That you will what? What's that word? That you will? That you will what? That you will overflow with confident hope, confident light, confident love through the power of what? Yourself, your biblical knowledge, your church attendance, your grandma's faith. It says confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is where we draw our strength from. He is our source of hope, peace, joy, contentment, purpose, mission, worth, value. In him, we find it. And our life is to overflow to the power of the Holy Spirit. My prayer today is that we would choose today to be a church, a people, a group of Jesus followers who are the saw and light of the earth. Remember, saw represents your influence in the world. Light represents your testimony in the world. May you choose today to be salt and light that we would be those agents of hope for the world. I'm gonna ask you right now all this place, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet for just a moment. I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come forward. Again, they're in red t-shirts today. And they're here today for one reason, and that's to pray with you today. I think there's some of you today who need to begin your journey today, a journey of faith, of putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Some of you could be honest today. You don't have the gift of the Holy Spirit because you've never put your faith and trust in Him. You're walking around today in your world is overclouded by darkness. All you see is darkness all around you. You've never been given the light of life through Jesus Christ. Some of you today, you need to begin your journey there. You gotta start there today. You gotta begin that journey there so that your life can be full of all these things were promised. You gotta begin today to walk away from some sin, die to some things, surrender your life ultimately to Jesus Christ and begin to have your life full of all of these things that he's promised us. But you can't get there without first surrendering your life to him. Many of us here today, if we could be honest, we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, but we're hiding in the shadows, terrified to be bold for him, terrified to be salt and light. I think some of us need to pray today for a boldness in our homes, in our marriages, with our kids, on our college campuses, our high school campuses, our middle school campuses, that we would be the salt and light that God has called for us to be. He has not called for us just to blend in, to put our heads down, put our heads in the sand and wait for our eternal glory, our eternal retirement plan in heaven one day. He says, I've gifted all of this to you so that you would be my change agent in the world. Are we fulfilling the mission that God has given us? I think some of us today need to fall on our face before God and surrender that we've been chasing after our mission and not after his. God can work today when you and I are willing to get honest with him, to fall on our face, to repent. Repent is the act of turning from the path we're on and turning towards God and what he has for us. Maybe some of us today should repent. We made our careers and our families and our relationships and money and sex and fame, porn, I don't know what it is. And we put it in front of God. And we cannot, we cannot be polluted by the world and culture and be the salt that God wants for us to be. We got to be quick to recognize, quick to repent and turn to him. And I promise you when we are, he is so quick to forgive and show us grace and love and mercy. And that's part of the journey. Let's pray for you today. God, in this moment, God, wherever we are, God, I pray today that we would see you for who you are. God, you are a God who loves us and you love big. You love so much that you paid the ultimate price for every single one of us through your son, Jesus. I believe there are some of us today who need to receive that message need to receive the love and the grace and the hope of Jesus. We need to surrender our lives to you today. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the salvation and grace of our sins. Thank you for an eternity and a place called heaven, God, where we don't have to spend our lives in eternal darkness. Thank you that you made a way and that Jesus is your way, the way, the truth, and the life. God, I believe there are some of us here today who know the way, the truth, and the life, but we're not leading other people to the way, the truth, and the life. 
I pray in this moment, God, that you would shake us. You would embolden us. You would inspire us. God, you would give us the courage to stand, to stand up for what's right and to point people to your truth. That you give us the courage even today to maybe confess before you that we've been on a different journey, a different path. We've been trying to blend in. We've been trying to hide in, the, in, in nooks and crannies. God, I believe today you're going to call your church out today to stand firm and to stand strong in you. God, we love you today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you gained something from this content, that it helps you to follow, to grow, and to live for Jesus. We drop new content just like this every Monday morning. So we want to invite you back. And the best way to do that is to follow, like, and subscribe on whatever platform you're watching to stay connected to everything we have going on here at Hope Church.